Hey everybody, before we get into today's episode, I want to take a minute to introduce our latest service called Crowd Insight by Gadgetflow. It's an awesome tool we made to help you get honest feedback for your upcoming crowdfunding project. Some of the big results we've seen include increased conversion rate, finding out why your project isn't performing well, and getting feedback you need from potential backers. So please head over to gadgetflow.com slash crowd insight to check it out today. You can also find a link in this week's show notes. Now let's get into the episode. Hello world, this is the Gadget Flow Podcast, the show about everything related to products, entrepreneurship, marketing, and crowdfunding. This week, I got to sit down with Alex Ledoux, and Alex is a serial entrepreneur turned angel investor, and he has grown multiple million dollar businesses, and he just turned 26 years old, so he's definitely an expert, and we asked him a bunch of questions about what it's like to build a business at that scale, and what it's like to be a full-time angel investor. So super awesome interview, so without further ado, here is our interview with Alex Ledoux. All right. I am here with Alex Ledoux. Alex, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. We're so, so excited to have you on the Gadget Flow podcast this week. Um, maybe for, for our listeners who don't know who you are, maybe just give a, a little bit of background, who you are and what it is you do. Yeah, absolutely. I can kind of give you the two-minute overview. Um, so I'm your pretty typical, stereotypical serial entrepreneur, uh, mostly in the e-commerce space. So I've grown and sold uh, three companies at this point, the biggest of which was a company called uh, EcoFlower. Um, so we, we were able to grow that um, to about $10 million in revenue uh, and over 100 employees at the time of my exit. So I exited uh, at the uh, tail end of 2016. Uh, so EcoFlower was a company that made uh, floral bouquets and home decor items made from recycled materials, so mostly wooden flowers. Um, so after that exit, I ended up becoming the uh, CEO of Ice.com, which is one of the largest uh, online jewelers. They were actually the second company to bring um, jewelry online. Um, had good success there, but ended up um, wanting to pursue angel investing full time, which is kind of where I'd always wanted to be. So um, ended up uh, turning to angel investing full time. So now I'm just purely a strategic angel investor in the consumer good space. Um, have five portfolio companies, four of which are in the consumer goods space and always just looking for additional investment. So I really have a kind of a marketing and marketplace uh, team um, that I come and put behind the businesses I get involved in. So it's both capital uh, and strategic, as well as obviously the plug and play talent. So um, that's what I've been doing for the last, uh, I guess, coming up on 18 months and, and really liking that and just continuing to, to look to scale that. Awesome. Yeah. So you're, you're not busy or anything. <laughs> no, not at all. Nah, yeah, I'm just kidding, man. No, it sounds <laughs> like, I mean, you've, you have so much uh, expertise and so much, you know, uh, like history and business under your belt. So I, I'm just curious, how old are you, Alex? I am 26. So I'll turn 27 in December. Yeah, that's absolutely crazy how much you've done already. So I have, I have a bunch of questions. Um, but first, I kind of want to get your backstory. Like, wh- how, did you, how did you become interested in, in becoming an entrepreneur? What was kind of the first thing you started doing? How did you climb so high so fast? Just give me a little bit of, you know, maybe uh, where you were when you're 16, moving into your 20s when you started making all these huge leaps. Sure. Um, so I, I really did all the stereotypical things growing up. Um, any business that a typical teenager would be doing, I, I was generally doing. Um, so, you know, whether it was a uh, lemonade stand in third grade or selling Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh cards and then working up to, you know, lawn mowing companies and um, that type of thing. So all of that was very typical through probably high school. Uh, in college, I'd say is really where it started. I really took an interest to uh, online marketing um, and was able to kind of start having some freelance clients and start learning that side. That was really my background and what has kind of kicked off my success in the, in the digital world. Um, but, uh, before that, I, you know, I, I guess in college, I, uh, was never much of a gamer, but my, my brother certainly was. Um, so I saw an opportunity in, uh, in electronic sports, which is known as esports. Um, so I started a, a professional, uh, League of Legends 
2015, which is actually one of my first exits. Um, so what I what I did was uh, I didn't have any money. I was a broke college kid at the time. Um, so I convinced um, a handful <laughs> of, uh, of kids, actually, um, you know, anywhere from 18 to 22 year olds uh, to put together a team on a profit sharing model. Um, so we ended up opening a professional team in a, in a professional team house in Santa Monica, California. Uh, and played in um, all the premier leagues and made our money much through like the NASCAR or any sponsorship model where, you know, we wore the logos on the jerseys uh, and did endorsements. So we played in front of uh, uh, about 8 million people on a, on a weekly basis um, and were able to scale that actually to a pretty good size. That was actually my first exit. I, I really saw the opportunity because uh, my brother was always kind of watching these live streams and this, mm. this is like underworld kind of under, you know, under the radar market, but it's actually incredibly big. And now their viewerships are, you know, matching, uh, you know, world series or whatever it may be. Um, so I saw an opportunity and kind of jumped on that. That was really my first dive into it, uh, made a ton of mistakes, but fortunately they weren't catastrophic. Um, so I was able to scale that to a pretty good size, as I said, but, uh, really the opportunity I saw there was just that, you know, the, the, these players who are playing and practicing, you know, 12 to 16 hours a day, six to seven days a week, um, you know, they were the runs, the ones running the business side. Um, so I had, you know, been going to school for some business stuff and thought I had a little bit more capability than, uh, than, you know, than a, someone playing and just didn't have the time for it. So, uh, that was really the biggest thing is I was kind of the first one in esports to look at it from a business perspective. Mm. Uh, so we made our money through sponsorships. We had, you know, we had the, the unknown version of hot pocket, the less known version of energy drinks, <laughs> <laughs> those type of things. That's awesome. Uh, obviously all the, you know, the major um, gaming companies, whether it's Razor or something like that were behind us. But um, that was, that was certainly pretty fascinating, uh, especially just because we were trying to, you know, we had, you know, we were hiring, <laughs> we had like a, uh, uh, we we're hiring professional like actors and stuff to come in and train our, you know, our, 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 our players to become a little bit more comfortable in front of the cameras as that's obviously where we we're making our money. So we were doing, and we we're doing very like, um, I guess it was product placement that you could get away with, uh, you know, six years ago, we yeah. literally just, like set the drink in front of the screen. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's awesome. Very just like blatant and obvious. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I wish I was, you know, in the scene now, uh, but that was really how I kind of got into it. Uh, and then from there, I really just realized like, Oh, I really love the business side. Like this esports been cool and the community aspects really, uh, really awesome. But you know, I think my digital marketing practices can be, can be used elsewhere. Um, and then after actually it was like seven days after I graduated, um, college, I, uh, ended up co-founding, um, EcoFlower. So it was really a pretty, pretty immediate transition after, after university. Okay. So I'm curious, wh how old were you when you, when you started EcoFlower? Like 22, 23? Yeah, I would have been like 22. Okay. So I'm curious how you grew and scaled EcoFlower. Like what maybe I know that there are so many things we probably don't have time for all of them, but maybe give me give me like a few of the things that you did in order to scale such a large business at, at your age. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing I'll say is it was fortunate. It was a very the, the viral coefficient of the product was great. Um, and this was again five years ago where where social and organic was a little bit more relevant, right? Before mm -hmm. these social platforms have totally almost turned to a pay to play model. Um, so we were able to in the first twelve months experience pretty good growth purely on the organic uh, sharing and viral coefficient factor, which certainly helped. Um, but really, it was it really just kind of compounded the our marketing efforts. Um, so really put, I mean, it was mostly through Facebook ads. Um, we were able to scale the business certainly was the biggest advocate, uh, and then built a pretty good community. Um, we ended up just kind of building a behind the scenes Facebook community, um, which we would promote through our, you know, email marketing and inserts and packages and obviously on our Facebook ads. Um, and that was really able to, that allowed us to really interact with our customer and build a good core community. Um, which definitely directionalized our, you know, ourselves from a product development perspective. Um, and then fortunately we were in the flower space, which really has a ton of, uh, you know, core target markets, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, our, our bread and butter was the gift market initially for birthdays, anniversaries, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were able to quickly expand that in obviously weddings uh, and the craft scene and that type of thing. So, um, but certainly through really good core digital marketing practices, I would say, um, Facebook was the biggest for us because it was a, you know, we were selling wooden flowers. So it's not like AdWords was very relevant. I mean, wooden flowers, even today, 
you know, the search volume so low. Um, so we were really going out and creating a market for our product because it was a product that had never, you know, previously really been seen. Um, mm. So that was probably the biggest thing is core digital marketing practices. Um, and then just really being super hyper focused on the product and the quality and the, you know, the experience and team. So we we're definitely trying to build a brand uh, and realize that was the only way we could expand. So, um, you know, our product was ever evolving, uh, which is important in that space. And then, uh, um, really just trying to put as much focus on a good customer experience, um, which is, which is tough when you're scaling that fast. Right. Um, right. I'm sure. We, you know, angered plenty of customers along the <laughs> way, but our, you know, our intention was always, our intention was always good. Um, and then obviously the seasonal spikes are probably the biggest thing. So, um, we, we learned a lot of lessons in that certainly. Yeah. So I'm curious what, out of all of that, what would you say was the most challenging part? And this can go for, for that company or, you know, ice.com, but what would you say is the most challenging part of building and scaling, uh, businesses like that? Like what's the most challenging thing you face personally? And maybe how did you overcome that challenge when you, when, sure. it, when you face it? Sure. So I would say the biggest thing is the, uh, certainly the biggest the biggest challenge is talent, right? So, mm. um, and operational. So I honestly, when I, when I first started the business in the business world, I, 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 I didn't realize how challenging that aspect would be. Um, but just the relationship part of it and actually growing and, and operational or running efficiently at that size. Right. So towards my end of time at EcoFlyer, we had, you know, over a hundred employees, um, uh, obviously many of which were, you know, low level, uh, you know, labor, right. So just kind of your bare bone fulfillment and, you know, florist labor, mm -hmm. um, but also a pretty good size management team. So, um, obviously as you scale a business, your, your time as a, you know, a founder, kind of a key driver, um, becomes more limited. Uh, so it's, you know, the only way to actually scale efficiently in all the areas you need to scale efficiently is through the appropriate talent. Um, so I would say really put a, you know, putting a focus on talent. Um, I've certainly think I've had a much, I guess, higher degree of talent, uh, in the, in the management structure from business to business as I've, you know, done more and more just because I've realized the importance of it. Um, and you know, the, the, the work hard, you know, the, the individuals who work hard and, you know, get stuff done only can get you so far. And, you know, the key is to find the people who work hard and live for it, uh, but also have an incredible skill set, right? And they do exist, they're hard to find and they can be expensive, but um, generally if they're managed appropriately, um, they can be very worthwhile. So I would say that's probably the biggest thing. And they're just running, running efficiently at that, right? So, um, you know, at EcoFlower, obviously, labor was a big part of our cost, right? Right. Um, just on the, on, the, on the actual making the product. Um, and there's natural tendencies for your you know, for your labor efficiencies to decrease uh, as things scale, which obviously can kind of mess with your your unit economics. So I would say just putting a really big focus on 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 building a very strong core team and make sure you have processes and organization organizational structure that allows you to scale appropriately. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm curious if you could give some insight into how to find good talent. What what did you learn about that process? Like how to decide like is this person the right fit for what we're doing? Sure. That's a great, great question. So, um, I, I mean, obviously I started by, I guess I'll walk you through the whole process. So the media thing was obviously just using, um, you know, job boards, right. Whether it's indeed or uh, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. Um, and then, and then really realized that, you know, that's only half of, you know, half of the battle, um, started certainly implementing some sort of, uh, head hunting processes. And I mean, that's not rocket science, um, obviously just utilizing LinkedIn, uh, and going out and finding the right people, um, had fairly good success with that. Obviously it's kind of hit or miss. And oftentimes you're not, you know, you're trying to, you know, snipe or steal them potentially from a, you know, a company, um, that treats them very well. So it can sometimes that transition over can be, you know, can be one that can be hard to fight for. Um, and then on the actual hiring side, I think that the biggest thing is, you know, whether, you know, everyone thinks they have great instincts and they can read people and all of that, but, um, the art of interviewing is, is flawed, right. And it's very wow. hard to, especially for some of these very skill set based, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's someone in, you know, whether it's a developer or, you know, a chief marketing officer or something like that. Um, it's very, it's a very hard job to interview for. Right. So, right. um, I've had pretty good success with, uh, with, with using skill like tests, whether it's case studies or, or something, um, and implementing that in the inventory or sorry, in the interview process to make sure it just as a way to double check, to verify, to make sure they're, you know, make sure their skill set is where you think they are. 
Um, so I've definitely been able to improve the, the skill set test um, and, and make it more so it's, you know, not hit or miss. But really, it's, it's hard to come up with a skill set test in, a, you know, in an area you don't know. Um, so I, that, would, I, that would probably be my biggest advice is on, is on that side, just really uh, making sure that you're not just purely basing it off of the interview. Um, cause there's a lot of people who, you know, will, will claim they, you know, know marketing, right. And can maybe sure. you know, talk, um, but can they actually deliver is a, is a whole different level. Um, and then, um, yeah, I would say that's probably, I would say that's probably the biggest element and then just certainly be willing to, you know, unfortunately not every relationship works out. And sometimes that can be on the employer. Sometimes that can be on the employee. So, you know, being very crucial, um, and very critical of the first 30 days and being, you know, very upfront, you know, that this is definitely a test, right? Uh, right. You're testing right. If you like to work for us. We're testing if we like to work, you know, like to work with you, um, and, you know, be willing to unfortunately, you know, pull the plug when you have to, um, if it doesn't work, obviously you'll go through the mechanisms of, you know, verifying and giving chances and trying to train and having those harder conversations. But, um, but it doesn't always work out. And I see oftentimes, you know, people maybe feel bad about it and now they're stuck with a, you know, executive level talent that, um, a, the company really can't, you know, afford, um, if it's not being spent correctly. Right. So, um, just being very, very upfront that it's a test stage and making sure the relationship works, uh, you know, in the first 30 days. And if not, you know, moving forward or moving in a different direction. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense, man. So I'm, I'm curious cause you know, your stuff and I'm curious what, what was the turning point that made you decide you wanted to become a full-time angel investor? Instead of, um, instead of running, running companies, maybe you're, you're just wanting to invest in them. What was that moment when you decided that? Sure. Um, I mean, uh, one, sorry, well, there's a couple elements to it. One is obviously having the capital to do so, right? Hmm. Uh, and exits have allowed me to do that. Um, but I think the biggest, the second part is, is although, <laughs> although I, I, I love the startup grind, right? Um, and it's one of those things that you, I feel like you, I feel like it's, it's kind of a once in a lifetime experience. Right. And it's like, it's the most overbearing uh, thing when you're doing it. And then you look back at it and you kind of, you know, it becomes appealing. Um, I don't know if I ever want to go through that again. From the <laughs> up, right. Yeah. Um, I just think it, you know, it's so much more, so much more enjoyable uh, to come in um, at the stage that I come in, which is, you know, generally, uh, you know, late seed or, or early stage, you know, whether it's stage A or whatever you want. Um, and oftentimes I'm working with individuals who aren't, you know, super familiar with the investor process. So, um, but relatively, I guess you could say early on, uh, but they're to a point where they have some level of foundation. They're to a point where, you know, they validated the product or the market fit. Um, and now, you know, now it's just, you know, attacking low hanging fruit on the marketing side or, or going after, you know, huge gaps in their target markets or, um, you know, just big ways to develop the business. Um, but without that foundation, it's just so tough, right? It's, it's literally, you know, the founder or the founders, um, with no money, you know, in a garage and, you know, they have all these ideas, but just can't execute on everything, anything because they're literally fulfilling the orders and don't have any you know, foundation. So, um, so although that's thrilling, um, you know, I, I, you know, certainly it's so much more enjoyable to come in a little bit later when they've already had some level of foundation and then be able to aggressively scale that. I love the, the scaling element. Yeah. Um, it, you, you have to have a business that's ready to be scaled. Um, and there's certainly some criteria that have to be checked off to, to make that relevant. Yeah, absolutely, man. I think you've, you paid your dues, your startup dues. <laughs> and now you, and now you're, you know, able to come in and use that expertise to help grow other people's businesses, you know, and, and get a chunk of that, which is, which is awesome. So I'm curious if you, I'm thinking of, you know, uh, 18, 19 year old, maybe in college, who is considering launching a business. And I want to know what is the most important thing for them to maybe focus on when they're launching their first product or business? Or, or whatever it is that they're wanting to launch. What do you think is the most important thing for them to focus on? Sure. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously it kind of depends uh, industry and product, but I guess broad stroke um, being data driven, right? So, um, and I made these same mistakes when I started. Um, everyone loves to go make business decisions based off of uh, anecdotal, you know, feelings or emotions or, or, you know, small, small, you know, sample sizes, right? right. Family and friends that, you know, speak well of the product. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I definitely think being data driven and using that from the top down. So, you know, I, I oftentimes see, um, you know, both side on the bootstrap, but also, you know, I oftentimes see, you know, I probably look at, I don't know, five to 10 businesses on a weekly basis and pretty consistently see businesses that 
have spent you know hundreds of thousands of dollars developing a product that that they have no clue if there's actually a market fit right, right. Um, so being super hyper focused on the data side i think there's a couple easy ways to do this um the first would be um obviously like surveys uh you know i i, I think surveys can be done very well and i think they can be done very poorly and at the end of the day you know, just because someone says they're you know willing to spend three hundred dollars for this product doesn't mean they are, right? right. Um, so I would use I would I would look at the survey results with kind of a grain of salt, um, but overall I think you can get some some pretty good insight on uh, on on the best way to you know navigate forward with it. Um, so I think that's that's certainly a part of it. Um, I would say that's the the being data driven using surveys, um, but also using you know paid ad platforms, right? So. For a lot of these, you know, inventions or whatever it may be, um, you know, there's not necessarily, a, you know, an existing market. So you're kind of creating a market. So your primary source for kind of top of funnel is probably going to be Facebook. Um, so it's okay to run Facebook ads, you know, without having, without actually having a completed product, right? And just testing different things. Maybe you're testing the, you know, core features of the product. Maybe you're testing um, the, the design of the product. Maybe you're testing the, the name of the product. Uh, price points, whatever it is, but um, just being very data driven, obviously testing kind of one variance at a time um, and seeing seeing what works or what doesn't work, right? Um, and, and it can literally be spending, you know, five to ten dollars running, you know, six different series of Facebook ads and going to a website that, you know, doesn't even, or a landing page that, you know, doesn't even work or a landing page is just trying to capture emails and saying, sorry, you know, not available in your area or whatever it may be. Um, but using that as a way to judge level of interest um, instead of just being purely anecdotal. So there's really very cheap and effective ways to uh, be able to test um, test target market. So I think that's the biggest thing is make sure your target market is, you know, you actually have one. Um, and then and then really the entire business comes down to, you know, the unit economics, right? So um, on a high level, you know, obviously if you have a website that maybe has 20 sales, you can start to gather this data. Um, and this would be data, you know, such as like, you know, what is your average order value? And then obviously what is your profit on that? And then ultimately, you know, what does it take to acquire a customer? Um, and there's obviously different elements that go into each of these components, but making sure you have kind of a working model as far as unit economics. Um, and, and with that thinking in a, you know, scalable fashion, you, you, you can't forever be the one shipping the product. You can't forever be the one, you know, handling customer service. You can't forever be the one, you know, doing all your marketing. So those type of things. So thinking scalable, um, making sure you have a good market fit and then making sure your unit economics work. Ultimately a business purely comes down to, you know, the unit economics work. Um, and you know, if you have, you have a terrible product um that's going to show up in reviews or that's going to show up in bad press um and that's going to you know kind of destroy a certain component of your unit economics so um at the end of the day i i really look and evaluate businesses based on you know their unit economics um and and how well i think i can scale the marketing side yeah no that's a, that's great advice i think i think figuring out whether or not there's a market before you th- just believe blindly that there is a market I think is so key, but I also think it's a, a huge fallacy that people, you know, deal with every day is just assuming because you think it's a good idea or a good product or whatever that other people will too. Um, and so just, uh, I mean, yeah, I love that advice of just even doing the little pay, the paid ad thing to validate that there is actually interest in your product with the different variations and things like that. I, I think that's awesome, man. So, what is next for you? Like what's coming up for you? What's, what's, what's going on in your world? What are you excited about that's coming up? Sure. Um, so I've actually finally kind of put together my, uh, investment firm, um, working with a couple key on their uh, key other individuals with very similar backgrounds to me. Um, so we're actually launching that website today. Uh, exciting enough. So it's, uh, it'll be Carta K A R T A uh, ventures.com. Um, so really, we've we've had really good success on deal flow um, without really ever putting a central effort um, on the investment firm or without you know having case studies or or more about the team or anything like that. Uh, so we're really just centralizing those and trying to get as aggressive as we can on the deal flow side um, because we've really been able to systemize the processes and you know feel like we can scale the marketing efforts um, uh, for for a lot of businesses. So we're we're very excited on on in that aspect um, and and ready to certainly uh, find our next deal. That's awesome, man. So, so, okay. What was the website again? The URL? Cartaventures.com. K-A-R-T-A ventures.com. 
Awesome. And that'll be in the show notes for everyone listening. So make sure to go check that out. And are you on Twitter, uh, Instagram, any of those handles? Do you care about those things where people can get in touch with you? I'm not. Um, I think the best way would probably just be through cardadventures.com. Um, awesome. You can certainly connect via that. Um, but no, I'm, I'm more of just a LinkedIn guy. So. <laughs> All right, man, that works. Well, Alex, thank you so much for being on, man. I, I think you're obviously a total expert at what you do, and we appreciate all the advice you've given us today on the Gadget Flow podcast. So thank you so much for being on, man. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. That was my interview with Alex Ledoux. So please make sure to check out everything he's working on at Carta Ventures and make sure to connect with them online. Thank you so much for being on this week, Alex. This podcast is made by GadgetFlow, and we are proud to be the number one platform to find new and awesome gadgets. So make sure to check out our site for all the new products we're curating every single day. We'll be back next week with another new episode, so in the meantime, please go rate and review our show on iTunes. Until next time, thank you so much for listening to the GadgetFlow podcast.